Hey, today we're starting a new series called Endgame. It has nothing to do with the movie. It has everything to do with the end of life, though. What is the endgame? There was a Sunday school teacher asking his class of children uh, a question. He said, if I am nice to my sister, and if I say my prayers at night and brush my teeth and, and do my chores, is that enough to get me into heaven? And the kid said, no. He said, if, if I'm kind to the pets, if I treat them well, if I help the, the neighbors, if I shovel their driveway in the winter and sweep their sidewalks in the summer, is that enough to save me? And the kid said, no. He said, if I go to church every Sunday, learn the memory verses the teachers give me, and if I put money in the offering plate every time it's passed, is that enough to get me into heaven? And then with a louder voice, the kid said, no. So the teacher said, what then do I have to do to get into heaven? And there was a quiet in the room until the little boy in back raised his hand and said, I know, you got to be dead. <laughs> That's kind of true right now, right? Yeah. <laughs> you want to go to heaven, first step, die. Um, but there's more to it than that. Um, what is it that, we, that gets us into heaven? If, if God were to ask us, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? What would be your answer? See, uh, this time of year, kids are back in school, and I don't know if high school still does this, but college definitely does it. They'll give you a syllabus, and it'll tell you the, uh, the, the subjects you'll study. They may even tell you what's on the final exam. See, teachers are smart when they tell you, this is, what, this is what's going to be on your final examination. This is what you need to prepare for. I knew a college professor from Dallas Theological Seminary that used to tell his students exactly what was going to be on their final. Actually handed them the final to start the class. Said, here it is. Take it home. This is what you're going to, these are the questions you're going to get at the end of the semester. The other teacher says, why are you doing that? All these kids are going to study that and know those things and get an A. He said, isn't that the whole point? These are the things we want them to know. We, do, we don't want there to be any confusion about it. I thought, wouldn't it be great if God said, hey, day's coming when you're going to stand before me, and I'm going to let you know how to prepare for your final examination. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't it be great if God was just very clear about what it is we had to do with our lives? Because I think actually there's a lot of confusion, especially if you've grown up in church. Christians or church people are the most confused about the subject. It's almost better if you didn't have a prior background because we often have inserted other thoughts, other ways to get into heaven. But, you know, there really is clarity in Scripture. God has made it very clear in the revelation of His Word of what His heart is, what He's looking for in our lives. And, you know, I feel a real burden for this because I, I pondered this verse all summer long. It's just like, it's like God just wanted me not to preach through a book of the Bible this fall, but to focus on this one verse, dissect it, look at it, really help people understand it because this is very critical. It's critical for me personally that I'm prepared at the end of my life, how I'm living my life. I'm preparing for that final exam, but also for all of you. If I'm a pastor, if there's one thing I need to be doing is preparing God's people for the final examination. I just want to ask you, are you ready for that? Are you ready for your final exam? There's a gal in our church who went back to school to get a degree, and she was studying for one of her finals. She spent hours and hours the night before. The next day, she arrived in class. She found out that the exam was on different chapters than she had studied. And she said, oh, my goodness. Panic just overwhelmed her. Like, I'm going to fail this class because I studied the wrong thing. Wouldn't it be tragic for us to think all along, I thought, God, you wanted this. And God says, where'd you get that idea? Didn't it make it pretty clear in Scripture? And you may not know this verse we're going to look at, but, but we're going to get to it uh, later in the sermon today. And then we're going to, uh, like I said, start to break it down in the weeks to come so we really can get good at the things God wants us to be good at. But before we do that, I want to start by looking at what's not on the final. See, there are things I think that are commonly assumed are on the final. And I want to assure you, they're not. They're all good things. They're all good things. They're just not the most important things. So, for example, here's number one. This is commonly believed that um, this is on the final, how much of the Bible I know. I want to tell you, that's not on the final. There is no Bible entrance exam at the end of your life, and some of you are going, whew, because you don't know a whole lot about the Bible. I mean, like me, I grew up in a church where I knew the major characters and the major stories of the Bible, but I really wasn't qualified enough to teach it to anybody. 
And maybe you're in that boat. You feel like, I know some of the things, but I have a hard enough time just, just navigating where things are in the Bible. When I went to Bible college, you know, all these other students that were in Bible college grew up in churches that emphasized the Bible. Mine didn't. I mean, mine was a bunch of good people, but they really didn't emphasize that the Bible was that critical. And so when I got there, and we did take a Bible knowledge quiz, I realized that I'm a biblical moron. I, I, I don't know hardly anything about the Bible other than when we get to Jesus, then I know something about him. But the rest of it, I knew very little. But you know, I know a lot more now. I know a lot more now than I ever did before. See, when I, when I went to college, the, the most worn out part of my Bible was the index. Because I had to open up to say, is that New Testament, Old Testament? I don't know. Let's find it really quick. Okay. And then flip over there. That's how I kept up. But, you know, now I've, I've been, you know, making God's Word a regular part of my life, I know a lot more than I ever did before. And I would tell you, you should get to know God's Word. It is critical for spiritual growth. It is essential for your development. In fact, it's so essential that the Bible describes, uh, or the Bible describes itself like spiritual food. It's milk for the newborn. It's bread for daily consumption. It's meat for the mature. It's even sweeter than honey, so it's kind of like dessert too. It's everything. It's a, it's a full course meal, God's Word. So we preach it. We teach it. Small groups focus on it. Everything in our church really is getting people deeper in a God's Word. It's important. It's essential for your growth. It's just not essential for salvation. Now, how I know this is because the most knowledgeable people in the Word in Jesus' day were groups of people called the scribes, teachers, and Pharisees. And they knew the Scriptures better than anybody. In fact, they had committed it many times uh, in memory, large portions of the Scriptures. And yet, for some reason, that amount of Bible knowledge wasn't sufficient to save them. In fact, Jesus encountered them in John chapter 5 and said to these guys, you search the Scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. In other words, you guys keep reading the book, but you miss the story. There's a story in here, and it keeps pointing to me, Jesus said, and you aren't getting that. You're studying the Bible like a textbook, like a rule book. You're looking for the wrong thing, and your knowledge has become a barrier to God instead of a bridge to God. It's keeping you from him, not leading you to him. Our Bible knowledge was meant to lead us into a relationship with God, not to inflate our egos, not to make us experts at biblical trivial pursuit. It's to lead us into a relationship with God. The opposite of those people were these ones who were most pleasing to Jesus. Some of the people that impressed Jesus the most were people that were outside the Jewish community, didn't grow up learning the Scriptures, didn't know their Bibles, couldn't tell you the characters of Scripture, and yet when they heard the gospel message about Jesus, they said, I want that. I want to follow that man. And, and they got saved with this much Bible knowledge. Now, look at this. This much Bible knowledge, they're saved. This much Bible knowledge, they're not. Because Bible knowledge alone doesn't save. Like I said, it's good if it leads you in the right direction. See, Paul wrote to Timothy something very important. He says that God desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. The knowledge isn't of biblical information. The knowledge is of the truth, who God is, who we are, who he sent Jesus to be in our lives. The knowledge is to lead us into a relationship. See, what we need to know is not so much the contents of the book, but the author of the book. Get to know the person who inspired this book. That's where Bible knowledge becomes valuable. We're not saved by the knowledge. Secondly, we're not saved by being morally good. It's not how morally good you've been. In fact, this is probably the biggest misconception. If you'd ask most people, if you were to die tonight and you were to stand before God, and he would ask the questions, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? Now, this has actually been done. There was an evangelism program called Ev Evangelism Explosion, and they'd go around knocking on doors and asking people this question. The most common answer they got back from people was, um, I hope I've been good enough. God will save me because I've been good enough. Common assumption. I, I used to believe that. God saves good people, bad people go to the other nasty place. Okay? Good people go to heaven. Now, here's the problem. The assumption is, first, that good people go to heaven, Second assumption is that I'm one of the good people, right? Who in their right mind would say I'm not one of the good people? It's very rare you find someone who says, yeah, I'm not one of those. We all feel like we're good people. Why? Because we see people worse than us. 
The problem is our level of goodness or what we think is good keeps getting lower. It's like the bar was here and it's way down here now. I mean, just look at TV. For the last, I don't know, 30, 40 years, things that used to be objectionable, you know, language, violence, sexual expression, nudity, all that kind of stuff, you'd never see that on TV. It's pretty common on just regular programming TV in the evenings. And you know what? Some of those programs get awards. They're considered great programs, good programs. So, so good becomes this. And of course, I'm a little better than that, so I'm good. I'm, I'm a little better than, than the Jeffrey Epsteins and the um, Madoffs who, who, who steal millions of dollars from people and from Osama bin Laden's who are terrorists and all these. I'm better than them. And so I'm good. I, I'm qualified. But here's the problem. You and I aren't as good as we think we are. We're not as good as we think we are. In the book of Psalms, the writer says it this way, The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, any who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have come, become corrupt. There is none who does good. Not even how many? One. Not even one. It's not your child, it's not your grandmother, it's not your school teacher, it's not your pastor. None of them are good enough to be saved on their own merit. None of us are morally good. That's a hard pill to swallow. I remember in high school when I first understood this, because I used to think, I'm good, I'll go to heaven. And then when I realized I wasn't as good as I thought I was, I realized, oh my goodness, I'm actually a sinner. But here's a good thing. God sent Jesus to save sinners. If you're not a sinner, you don't get saved because you think you're good enough. So it's kind of a good thing to recognize, hey, I'm actually not as good as I think I am. Now, here's, here's where churches often per, uh, perpetuate this idea. We're, we come to church, we're all a bunch of good people, and we cover up you know, the sins in our lives. I don't know what you do in your private life. I don't know what you do on the internet. I have no clue. And you don't know what I do. We don't know each other's thoughts, but there's a lot more darkness in us than we like, like people to believe. You know where the most honest group of, of people is in this church? They meet on Friday nights called Celebrate Recovery. They've come to terms with who they are and what they've done wrong. But many of us don't do that. But it's important we acknowledge, yes, I have sin. In fact, I've got a lot of darkness within my life. Sin keeps us from the Lord, puts us in need of a Savior. And it wasn't until I recognized that that I uh, was able to surrender my life to Jesus. Now, I would say that verse from Psalms isn't totally correct because there actually was one good person. One person who was totally selfless, totally humble, totally focused on doing what's best for others, totally obedient to our Heavenly Father, and his name was Jesus. And you know what Jesus got for his goodness, his moral perfection? He got crucified. He didn't go to heaven. He got crucified first. The good news is his crucifixion was a substitute for you and me and our sins. He was crucified so that we could be forgiven. And that's a beautiful thing. That's the good news. We're saved not because we're good, but because he was good. It's like we're, we're accepting his goodness upon ourselves and then we're taking all our junk, all our sinfulness, and putting it on his shoulders so he can take it to the cross. That's the good news. So I'm not saved because I've, I'm good. I'm saved because he's good. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. So we should trust in Jesus, not trust in our goodness. But that may raise a question, which actually did in the Bible times. So, pastor, that, that means I don't need to be good. Because if, the, if my badness brings out the grace of Jesus, then I should be more bad, right? It, that's the logic that some people have, like, man, it's okay for me to be bad because that makes Jesus look even better. But, but the Bible says we don't want to go back to the thing that we were enslaved to. We're freed from that. Why would we want to go back and do those things that dishonor God? It would be like walking up to the cross and taking some more nails and say, Jesus, here's another one. Here's another one. No, no. The reason I live a good life, not a perfect life, but a good life, is to say thank you to God. Thank you for what he's done for me. We're not saved by our moral goodness. We're also not saved by my link to my family's faith. Now, 
I have to be a little careful here because some of us have deep-rooted family faith. Like, like for generations, my family's been Methodist, Lutheran, Baptist, Catholic, whatever it is. It goes back generations. We may have a whole clan of people that said that, that as far as our name goes, this is who we are. And some of you have that. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. There's, there's good and bad in every single denomination. The problem is when we think our connection to that family faith or that denomination is what gets us into heaven. Sometimes people believe that. Our, our particular brand of Christianity is the right one. And you only can be saved if you're attached to that one. And so there's this fear if you go to another church, like, ah, oh, you're out of the kingdom now. And I just want to tell you, we're not saved by our connection to a religious organization. And this was going on in Jesus' day. Now, they didn't have denominations. They just had a religion. And people would say, hey, because I'm Jewish and my ancestry goes way back to Abraham, who God made his covenant with, then I'm in. I'm part of the family. I'm in because of my genetic connection to Abraham. And, and Jesus cleared it up and says, no, you're not. He said in Luke 3, bear fruit in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. These stones that have no biological connection to Abraham, God says, I can raise them up and they're, they're going to be more faithful to me than you. Because your biological connection means nothing. See, Abraham is the father of those who believe like him. And Paul explains this really well in Romans. Our connection is through faith that, that's, that's in the footsteps of Abraham. Everyone who believes like Abraham becomes a child of God. A little bit later, um, Jesus said in John chapter 8, If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and am here. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desire. I mean, Jesus just calls them out. You want to know who your father is? It's the one you act like. And you don't act like Abraham, who believed God. You're acting like the devil, and therefore you must be his kids. See, the, the biological connection or our just affiliation with a group doesn't make us in, doesn't, doesn't include us in the family of God. We have to have a personal relationship with the Lord. Salvation is personal. Um, I have to place my trust in the Lord. It's not just because I'm Methodist, Lutheran, Catholic, Baptist, whatever. Really, that does, God's not looking for your label. He's looking for your faith. And so develop your own faith. Develop your own faith. Respect your family's religion. It may be that you go to the same church. That's fine. But what you want is not the same label. You want the same faith, the faith. Another thing that gets in the way sometimes of us in thinking what I have to do in order to prepare for the final exam is how well I perform the rituals. These are religious expressions. They were very big in Jesus' day. The Jewish people had hundreds of rules, things to do, things not to do, food to eat, food you avoided, uh, people you hung around with, people you avoided, um, ways you gave sacrifices, um, offerings, what, what you did uh, on the Sabbath day. All these things were, were rules that, that people did or did not do. And they said, if you, if you want to be a good Jew, you obey the rules. You do the rituals. If you can complete them, then obviously you're a pretty good person because you're doing the religious deeds. And uh, Paul's very emphatic in the book of Galatians of saying it doesn't work that way. In fact, here's what was happening in the church in Galatia. People had accepted Jesus as Savior, and then others had said, hey, that's good, but you need more than Jesus. You need to do these other things like observe the Sabbath, be circumcised, do all these other things, and, and then you'll be good. In fact, you know what? Paul writes to them in that letter, and he says, um, just a very short verse, chapter 2, verse 16, by works of the law, no one will be justified. He says, your works, your religious works, they don't do anything to make you acceptable to God. They're good as an expression of your faith, but they do not earn your status with the Lord. Now, this bothered them because they put a lot of emphasis on this. In fact, the biggest one was circumcision. You know, we're the ones that observe circumcision. In fact, that makes us a cut above everybody else. You know, I had a... I had a, a I had a, a couple catch me in the foyer after last service. 
And they said, Pastor, you need to come over to this table. Um, in our family, if my husband or I use a word the kids don't understand, then that person is responsible to explain it. <laughs> and you used a word in the sermon that our daughter, high school daughter doesn't know. And so you get to explain it. It's the word circumcision. So if, if, if you don't understand what that word means, then you talk to Pastor Sam and he'll explain it very clearly. <laughs> Because he just did baby dedication. He knows all about that stuff, okay? <laughs> now, speaking of baby dedication, this is one of the rituals in, in modern-day terms. We have our own religious rituals. Baby baptism is one of them. I grew up in a church that sprinkled, ba sprinkled water on babies. I, hate, I don't like saying sprinkled babies. A professor pointed out to me, you don't, you don't chop up babies and sprinkle them. You sprinkle water on babies, okay? Babies are sprinkled upon. Sometimes babies sprinkle upon people. but <laughs> So... Infant baptism in my church was a big deal, and, and we were Methodists, and the Lutherans did it, and the Catholics did it, and the Congregational, and the, and the Presbyterians, they all did it. So it was just considered, that's, what you, that's what, just what you do. If you don't do it, you must not believe in God. And so there was this pressure almost, even I felt it when, with our kids, like, oh, should we have them baptized as babies? But you know, there's never a teaching anywhere in Scripture telling us to baptize babies. It says, let the children come to me which sounds like children that are older that have the free will to come to him. And we do that. When children come to Jesus, want to give their life to Jesus, we, we welcome them and we baptize them. But it needs to be their choice. Baby, bapti or baby dedication is the parents saying, I want to raise my children in an environment where they have the best opportunity to enter into a relationship with the Lord. I want to make it easy for them to find Jesus. And so we can have rituals like baby baptism, communion, going to church, giving, being baptized, all these things. If I do these things, then I must be saved because I did the ritual. I just want to assure you, we are not saved by doing the ritual. We're saved through our faith in Jesus Christ. Rituals can express faith. It can be very helpful in expressing faith. They're just not a replacement for it. And then the fifth one, I just want to quickly go through this. I am not saved by what I profess to believe. Since the 1950s, the uh, Gallup organization have asked Americans about their faith. And he's asked them, uh, do you believe in God? And consistently, 90 to 95% of Americans say they believe in God. And then a few years ago, the Pew Research Company said, we want to um, probe a little deeper what that means. So they began to ask people more specifically, do you believe in the God of Scripture that's omnipotent, that's uh, uh, all-knowing, that's just, that's loving? Do you believe in that God? And the number drops down to 56%. 33% believe in a higher power, but not the God of Scripture. Which makes me wonder, what did that higher power promise you about eternal life? And what have they done to show that they're capable of bringing you to that place? See, when I look at the God of Scripture, He not only said that there's a life after death, He showed us through His Son's um, burial and resurrection that He can get us there. And so I, I put my trust in that God. But see, it's so easy to profess of faith. It's very easy, especially for politicians and others. Say, I believe in God. But you're no better than the demons. Do you know that the Bible says the demons believe there's a God? So saying you believe in a God isn't sufficient. Jesus said to a group of people, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. It's like their life is disengaged from their lips. They're not in harmony. They say one thing, they do another thing. God wants us to, to, if we're going to say it, then it should be backed up by our life. If you say you believe, it should be shown in the trust you exhibit. Make sense? Just saying you believe is pretty easy. Trusting God is hard. Picture a lady. She's up in a uh, multiple-story building. Say she's on the 10th floor. She's in the window. The building's on fire. There's no way she can go back into the building to go down the stairs. The fire is too, too pervasive. So the firemen arrive, and the fighters set up this cushion, this inflatable cushion, and tell her, we cannot reach you with the ladder, but you're going to have to jump. But we set up this cushion here, and you'll be safe. You just need to jump. Now, she can mentally say, well, I believe if I jump, I'll be safe. But it takes faith to actually jump. And see, it's so easy for us to say, I believe without ever trusting God. But it's trust that saves us. It's actually stepping out and entrusting ourselves to him. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, there's coming a day 
Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. See, there will be people who actually call Jesus Lord. Lord, Lord, I believe in you. Jesus said, yeah, but if you did, you know, why didn't you do what I asked you to do? If I was Lord, which means I'm the ruler over your life, it would have been shown by doing the things we've asked you to do. Your, your life needed to be linked with your lips. What you say, you needed to do. Walk the walk, walk the talk. Do that. That's what, what we need to do to show that we are professing faith. Because professing is good. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Well, we need to have our faith, actual faith, catch up to the profession of our lips. I want to walk with Jesus. I want to trust him with my life. If I have faith, then those confessions mean something. We, we may profess Christ, but we need to possess faith. We need to possess faith. Not just profess it, but possess it, have it. So these are all ways, uh, Bible knowledge, goodness, doing the rituals, um, professing Christ. What was the other one? Family faith. All those, none of those are sufficient to get us into heaven, but all of them are good. All of them are good. All of them have a value in our lives. They're just not good enough to save us. So what is? What is God looking for? I'll tell you, this, this is a verse I came across many years ago in the New, Inter New International Version that just kind of rocked my world because it really was so crystal clear. I thought, how come people don't talk about this more? It's, this, it's like right there. This is the verse. It's found in Galatians 5.6. It's right after Paul said that neither circumcision or uncircumcision has any value. He says this. This is Galatians 5.6 in the New International Version, second part of that verse. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. I want you to read that with me out loud. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Not one of many things that count. The only thing that counts. The only thing that counts. There should be no surprise at the end of our lives when God says, okay, I'm looking for faith and I'm looking for love. And you go, oh, really? I, I thought you were looking for something else. God says, could I have made it any clearer? The only thing, the only thing, the only thing that counts is this, faith, which connects us to God, and love, which outflows from that connection to God. That's all I'm looking for. It's very simple. That's all I'm looking for. All these other things should be contributing to developing faith and helping us to love. And so we'll just touch on it today. I'll just introduce it, but the next several weeks we'll look at what do we do to grow in these areas, to have one and astounding faith. We want to have a faith, but it's not a faith that's static. We want one that's astounding, one that's growing. It says in Hebrews chapter 6, without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. It starts here saying, God, I believe you're there. I really believe you're there, and I want to know you. I'm seeking you. I want to hear your voice. I want to follow you. He says, if you do that, you please me. If you don't do that, nothing else you do will please me. It starts there. You know I exist, and you seek me. And so uh, a gentleman came up to me. Uh, he's, he was coming to church with his wife. This is several years ago in our other building. He met with me privately, and he said, Pastor, he said, uh, I've been coming to church. I want to believe in God, but I don't. I don't know. I just, it's like I don't have a evidence for it. And I said, why don't you do this? Why don't you start every morning saying, God, I, I, I want to know you. I, I kind of... I, 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 I think you're there, but I'm not sure. But I need to know for sure. So would you reveal yourself to me? Because I am seeking you. So just make it a simple prayer like that. So for the next several days, he did it. A couple weeks later, he came up at the end of a service during prayer time, runs over to me and says, you won't believe this, but I've been doing what you said. I've been praying and telling God I'm looking for him. And he's shown up over and over again. He's answered several prayers in my life, and I've seen things that I know aren't coincidences. I believe. He gave his life to Christ and got baptized. See, if you seek him, you will find him. If you seek him with all your heart. And you want a faith that just continues to grow. The apostles came to Jesus and said, increase our faith. He said, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. We want a faith that is increasing you know, it's amazing that Jesus saw people that would come to him and trust him and it would say, and Jesus was amazed at their faith. Don't you want to be one of those that astounds the Lord with your faith? 
Jesus looks at you and goes, that, that person took me at my word. I'm amazed because most people don't do that, but that person does. Let's have an astounding faith. The second one is an abounding love. Abounding love. Paul prayed for this for the Philippian church. Their love would abound more and more. And what that means is I want a love that, that's, that's bigger and bigger, that embraces more and more people, that doesn't just love my family or people like me, but loves people different from me, loves people that are antagonistic to me, loves people that, that uh, believe different than me. See, it takes a love that comes from God to love people like that, people that maybe would offend you normally, says they don't offend me anymore. See, a love that con- it continues to expand is the kind of love that says, I love all the people that God loves. And guess how many people that God loves? For God so loved the world. It means you love lost people. You love hurting people. You love handicapped people. You love old people. You love young people. You love people of different colors of skin, different racial backgrounds. You love them all. That's the kind of love that that comes from God because God is love. And the closer you get to God, the the deeper your walk of faith, you will find yourself being transformed into a person of love, of love. We will become more like God. We'll We'll love people in deeper ways. We'll become more sacrificial in the way that we love people. That love flows from God. He's looking for an abounding love. In fact, this is the most important thing. When Paul wrote to the um, Corinthians, there's a chapter called the love chapter, chapter 13. Listen to this. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith as to remove mountains, that's a lot of faith. Well, it's impressive. He says, but if I have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. He says, all these things that might exhibit faith, they're disconnected from love. You cannot disconnect faith from love. Faith will always result. Real faith, genuine faith, the right kind of faith will always result in love. You say you believe, we'll get this in in the book of James. If you say you believe in me, it will show in the way you love people. So he ends this chapter saying, so now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest is love. See, in heaven, we won't have to hope anymore because hope will be fulfilled. In heaven, we don't have to to, uh, believe anymore because we're going to see him in person. We're going to be living with Jesus. But love will always remain. We will will continue in a relationship of love. And that's why Jesus said, um, all men will know you are my disciples, not by what you profess, not by your belief statement. They will know you're my disciples if you love one another. So that's where we're going deepening our faith, having an astounding faith and abounding kind of love. I just want to ask you to ask yourself, are you doing what matters most? Is the focus of your participation in church, daily Bible reading, prayers, are you, are you actually saying, God, stretch my faith, deepen my love, because that's what matters most to you? Would you do that? Because we're going to have a lot of opportunities, actually tangible opportunities in the weeks to come to do that. But right now, I'm going to invite you to stand. Prayer partners, if you'd be available up front. We're going to sing a song of response. And this is really a prayer. This song is a prayer. A prayer, a prayer saying, I believe in Jesus. Here's who you are to me. But a prayer that I want my life to be built on the love that you have to give. And maybe today for some of you, need, you need to release one of these misconceptions about what it takes. Maybe you've been heading down a path that really isn't a path that's leading you in the right way, just to release that. Maybe you're a person who thought you were good enough to be saved, and today you say, I guess I'm not. That's okay. Come to Jesus. Surrender yourself to him. He has open arms. He's already paid for your sins and offers forgiveness. So our prayer partners are here to pray with anyone who needs prayer for the rest of us. Let's lift our voice in this commitment of praise to Jesus.